Welcome to The Thriving Marriage, the podcast for those who want to get their spouse back in love with them and truly thrive. You'll learn why 95% of people don't save their marriage and the secret method no one else is talking about that will change everything for you. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? Let's, Let's turn, turn tragedy, tragedy to, to triumph. triumph. Here are your hosts, international marriage experts, Mark Johnston and Heather Choate. Podcast. My name is Mark Johnston, and with me is Heather Choate. Hello. <laughs> How are you doing today, Heather? I'm doing fabulous. Just came back from a midwife appointment for our eighth baby, so it was awesome to see that little person. Even gave us a little wave and a high five. So it's a good day. <laughs> I was, uh, you know, my wife and I. We we went through a midwife our, ourselves with several of our, our children, but I always think back to their. Um, and I'm drawing a blank on the name. Jim Gaffigan. He was there's this line of jokes that he talks about with you know because they used him in wife and joking about how people thought it was about witchcraft and anyways. Uh, <laughs> but that's not what we're talking about today. <laughs> uh, Heather and I are going to share with you the crucial step to saving your marriage. It's about buying time, um, and we want to show you how just slowing down or even stopping the divorce, gaining just a few months six months really uh, uh, can really greatly increase your ability to fully restore the marriage and get your spouse back for good. But as always, before we, we get into the, the meat of the, the podcast, we always like to start off with a client win. And uh, this week uh, I wanted to share the win of Bruce, Bruce Dorbert. So Bruce here, um, this is the whole thing here. This is I always like um, linking these wins to the topic. Uh, Bruce and his wife had been separated for quite some time. Uh, he, he put a post in the group. He says, huge win. My spouse has finally said she wants to come back home after living in our summer cottage for the past week, six weeks. No, we aren't out of the woods yet, and we'll need to continue to work on me and my mindset, but such a great day. Now, yes, they... Um, Bruce might not have been separated from his spouse as as long as some of you, but I mean, still, that's a big, big deal. I mean, this whole this whole topic here is kind of the idea of my spouse has said they they're done and they're leaving the marriage, and so what do you do? And I know from talking with Bruce, that was um, I believe that was the case with him as well. But these sort of situations can turn around, and this is right here um, a really important step. For that, so Heather, what do you, what do you think? Why do you think this is such an important step? Just gaining some time. Well, I'm going to preface that real quick, and then I'll get to your question. <laughs> um, that if you haven't listened to our previous podcasts, that you really need to go back and start from the beginning. Yes, Mark yes. and I, we're international marriage experts. We help couples from all over the world. And it's a step-by-step -step process. In fact, we call it our PATH method. It's an acronym. Um, for the four phases, the first being perspective, A being adjustments, T, tell a new story, and oh my goodness, H, hold out hope. <laughs> I can spell path. <laughs> anyway, so now that we got our ABCs down, um, so we are here on the H, which is kind of the final phase, and we've been wanting to give kind of a deeper dive into each one of these. And so if you're like, hey, we're struggling to communicate, hey, they won't even talk to me. Hey, they're pushing for divorce and these different things. And that's your struggle right now. Then definitely go back and listen to the first podcast. Because yeah. here at the end, it's not going to make any sense what we're talking about if you don't have kind of those fundamental pieces in place, because they truly build on each other. And now Mark and I, we share this in like 45 minutes with, with you guys. And um, that makes it sound maybe a little more simple than what it really is in reality. And especially last week, we were talking about um, how to tell a new story or how to change their story, which is the reasons why they want out of the relationship. And that takes a lot of time. And then once we're able to have that new story by making those adjustments, showing understanding, keeping communication open, taking the pressure off. I mean, these are just like bullet points of the big picture, right? So then we get to this phase. What's that? I was just saying, yeah, there's so much more to talk about. You're saying these are bullet points and yeah, it's just scratching the surface, really. 
exactly. And then when we get to this phase, it's hold out hope, which is having time. And so why it's so important is, you know, Mark and I, we've been helping so many people and we've recognized that the chances for you to fully restore your marriage, not just temporarily, not just fixing a couple of the symptoms, but to truly heal the root issues, we need to slow down or stop the process of divorce. And if we can get our spouse to agree to give us about six months of time, that's a ballpark figure, but around six months of time, then the opportunity to fully restore the marriage greatly increases. So today, Mark and I are going to give you kind of that high level overview. And I just want to share that it can be a lot to take in <laughs> uh, and, and to know that this is coming from the perspective of experts that have seen this happen numerous, numerous, numerous times. It's kind of like we can see it on the outside. We can detect the certain patterns and the phases that couples go through, right? And I, it reminds me of, I'm just going to share from my own life. Five years ago, I was sitting in a doctor's office and Ben and I had just drove seven hours from our home in Southern Colorado up to Denver to the Anschutz Medical Foundation. We've been told about this incredible oncologist that helped uh, helps young women with cancer, particularly pregnant women with cancer. And we're sitting there in her office and just like you, probably feeling an immense amount of emotions, some fear, some hope, some faith, some uncertainty, um, and all of that kind of jumbled together. And we go into her office. It's just kind of like a normal sterile <laughs> doctor's office. And in comes this very loud, vivacious Texas woman and uh, total contrast to kind of the energy of the place. And she said, you know, I know that this is really hard for you, but I just want to tell you, for me, it's just another Tuesday. And at first that kind of was off putting to me because I was expecting like maybe some more compassion or something. And it wasn't that she wasn't compassionate, but after I thought about it for a little while on the drive home, it actually was a huge comfort to me because she's been doing this so long and she's seen what it looks like. And she outlined, you know, you need to do this and then we're going to do this. And then at this stage, we're going to do this. And she outlined this huge treatment plan for us because she's done it so many times. She knows what it looks like. And so for her, it's just another Tuesday. For us, it was like this super rare, scary thing that we'd never heard anyone ever have to go through before, you know, fighting cancer while pregnant and, and having an aggressive form of breast cancer, right? That was crazy off the charts, you know? And for her, it was just another Tuesday. She's like, you know what? You're in good hands. You're safe. I've got you. You go through this method, you go through this step, you go through this treatment plan, everything's gonna be okay. So that's what Mark and I are sharing with you here. It's kind of like the treatment plan of we've seen this before. We've done it a million times. I know it's really hard for you, but for us, today's Tuesday, right? It yes. is Tuesday. Yes. Today we're recording this. It's on Tuesday, so I can I can say that. <laughs> for us, it's it just another Tuesday. Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> so with that being said, um, it's kind of the high level overview. It's the treatment plan. It's showing that that it's gonna be okay, you're in safe hands. We are experts and we know what this looks like. And so this might seem a little bit conceptual or it might seem a little out there, it might seem really far from where you are, and that's okay. What we wanna do is show you the bigger picture to give you that hope and show you what's possible. So with yeah. that all being said, <laughs> let's dive in. Yeah, no, like when I was starting with this, you know, my the first question that, that came to mind is, okay, well, why wouldn't someone want to give a little bit extra time to, to see if their marriage could go on? Um, I mean, most people have invested a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of many things into their, their marriage. And so it, it would seem simple then to say, okay, well, why don't we try for a little bit longer? But, you know, I, I want to recognize here that, uh, you know, a lot of people that come our way have probably tried asking to work on on the marriage just a little bit longer get a little bit more time and they've been turned down so i was thinking okay well what 
this got this has to make sense somewhere. This is you know going back to what you're talking about, Heather, that that path method. And I always think that you know starting off with that perspective, that understanding, is a really great place to start. And thinking to myself, okay, this has to make sense somewhere. So why does it make sense? Why wouldn't your spouse want to give you more time? And uh, I thought of a few things here. Now, some of these things, it actually reminds me of uh, a conversation that I had with some friends actually just earlier today. Yeah, actually, I hope they're not, almost hope they're not listening in here. I don't think they're actually a part of the, the <laughs> I haven't asked, asked them about this. But, you know, I was, um, I ended up going to the park with my family and met some uh, friends, you know, friends of ours. Um, and they, they came by and they were actually uh, complaining about the marriage. And I was thinking about, okay, well, what kind of, what kind of situation are they in? You know, you know, what kind of state of mind are they in right now? And, you know, how is that going to affect their relationship? But I was hearing some of these reasons. And so some of the ones that I was thinking of, you know, is there some ongoing pain? As in, like, okay, it's going to be mo more costly to wait um, and to extend their time together. Um, another kind of variation of that is they might get pulled back into a painful relationship. And Heather, you've talked with our clients. I mean, how often do you hear that excuse there, like that their spouse is concerned about being pulled back into the relationship? Right. Well, even more than an excuse, it, it feels very real, right? Well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's I guess when we say excuse, it's it's kind of dismissed a bit, but that's no excuses. Yeah, they're, they're they are real. Yeah, yeah. That's the reason why they don't want to come back. They're they're afraid of going back into a painful situation, or they're going back into a situation where their needs are simply not met. They feel continually ignored or continually disrespected, um, and yeah it's hard for them to want to see that anything can be different when it's been a certain way for so long or, you know, it goes right back into the narrative. What are the reasons mm -hmm. justifying why they want out? And they're going to hold on to that. And that's going to be what they believe until we learn how to change that. Yeah. Even beyond this, like even beyond just ongoing pain, because that I think makes sense to a lot of people. It, it, it's very on the surface, just pretty clear. Like, Hey, if, there's some big problems going on. You could understand why someone wouldn't want to delay a divorce or something. But I think there's other, you know, a lot of times there's more subtle things going on here. Like, for instance, if there's not really any perceived benefit of having more time, kind of the idea of why bother. And I hear this sometimes, especially with uh, the people who uh, their reason for leaving, they're saying, well, we don't love each other, each other anymore. I love you, but I'm not in love with you. So why would I, there's not really any benefit to coming back. There's just no feelings there. I, I, I really, I hear that one, that, that line right there so often. And I do think it's very well described by, you know, this list or statement here. There's just no, there's no benefit to having more time or perhaps it's, um, and I, I will see this one in cases more of, uh, affairs or s some other circumstances as well, but being married prevents or blocks other needs or benefits from being met. And so when we put all these together, I mean, you can see this, right, Heather, like why someone might say, well, no, I don't think I'm going to try anymore. Right. We have a comment here as we're streaming this live into our Thriving Marriage Facebook group. Husband is concerned that he, we will just go back to the old ways. It's just easier to move on. He has said that we did not appreciate him. So his block right here is that if I come back, it's just going to go back to the way that it was and I'm not going to feel appreciated. Maybe I won't feel significant. And so that then becomes it's easier to leave than to want to give more time to the relationship or to say, yes, I'm just going to come back. Yeah, I think what you said right there, it's is a huge, huge factor is that and I think we touched on this the other week where we're talking about how sometimes there are, I, I, know, I can't remember if it's in the podcast or another conversation I was having, but where there's more benefits that are perceived being away from the relationship than in the relationship. Um, like in that, that case, that person saying, well, you know, it's easier being away. I, there's more calm here and there's more, I get to do what I want here. And, you know, there's that, uh, 
there's that that excuse that we just went over. There's not really any perceived benefit to coming back because I'm not. I can meet these needs better outside of the relationship. Right. We hear I need to heal. I need space. I need to find myself. Here's a comment it says she won't put herself in a position to be hurt again um, for my very close friends. And we can touch base on where they're at now a little bit later as a teaser. <laughs> but um, it was that you just don't appreciate me and you're not affectionate. Again, it was that appreciation is a big one, but you're not affectionate and you don't meet my needs. I've been telling you for 24 years, 24 years, what, what I need emotionally and you aren't giving it to me. And so I think I just need to move on and not try to find that from you anymore because you're never going to give it to me. And so that was the reason, right? I, if I stay here, nothing's going to change. Or if I come back, nothing's going to change. And I'm not happy, right? It comes down to that. I'm not happy where I'm at right now. And so I think that if we end this, then we're going to find happiness somewhere else. And so, so does it really I, just real once again, just boil down to these needs? I mean, you listed all these things and all I was hearing in the back of my mind was, okay, these certain needs aren't met and I don't expect them to be met. Right. And so if we are the one that's saying that we want to save the marriage and we want this person to come back, this is a major obstacle that needs to be overcome. And that's why we spent, you know, numerous podcasts were on podcast seven. <laughs> so several podcasts up until this point, showing how to uncover what that story really is, knowing that these reasons are the surface level reasons, the deeper reasons are the root reasons that we always have to solve. Just like you couldn't put a bandaid on my cancer tumor and think that it's going to go away. Right. We had to solve it at the root level on an internal level on every single aspect, physically, spiritually, mentally, emotionally. Yeah. That was all part of the picture. And so we have to solve those problems at the roots and then we have to make some adjustments so that we start to tell them a new story. So in the example with my friend, um, uh, so she believed that he would never meet her needs, that he didn't care enough for her to even try. <laughs> and so what he had to do is make some adjustments and to show understanding. First, he had to find out what that really meant, because honestly, he had no clue. He just really didn't. He was genuinely clueless. <laughs> clueless. <laughs> had, I, I don't know what that means when she said, I need affection. And so he had to ask her those clarifying questions as they opened up communication and find out, oh, you want me to hold your hand in public. Well, I tell myself, he says, this is his words, I'm not a physically touchy-feely person. That's uncomfortable for me. He had to get past that to then meet her need, understanding how important it was to her that she have some physical touch, some physical affection in public, holding her hand, putting his arm around her. And as he started to do those things, making those A, adjustments, <laughs> then that started to tell a new story to her. At that point, telling the new story is like you're at war with the old story, right? It's that ping pong effect. It's the roller coaster. It's the teeter totter. <laughs> it's the ups and downs of telling a new story so that they believe that the changes that we've made are real and that they're lasting and that they will stay actually regardless of what happens in the relationship. So the positive changes being made because that's taking the pressure off. That helps it not be a manipulation, right? Mm -hmm. So then we can start to get to the point here where we can have a conversation. Look, I now understand you. I know what you're really needing. I know what you're really asking for here. Thank you for sharing that for me. I appreciate that. And I've been working really hard to improve myself, to make these changes. And I'm going to keep making them regardless of what happens in a relationship. You get to the point where you say, can we buy some time? We well, don't say it like that because they would not know what you mean. That's the terminology we use. <laughs> yeah. But can you give us some time to work on the relationship? Right. So let's dive into that, Mark. What does that look like? Yeah. So uh, you, you're making some good points here in that this isn't obviously this isn't like a, like a first step. And you, you certainly need to build. Right. Up <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, but in terms of like what you would actually need set up here to be able to ask for more time. Uh, I, I, cer I do think that, you know, a lot of those principles in, in our, the path method are, is a good starting point, but just to be very specific with this thing right here, I do think that um, 
you know, the the prospect of spending more time in a as a couple, it needs to provide some sort of benefit. Um, you know, even if that's not like necessarily a direct benefit to the individual, but just a benefit in general. Uh, you know, sometimes I'll see that, um, you know, that staying together, you know, it, some people stay together just for some financial reasons or some more material reasons. And that's, that's all well and good. I don't think that's um, necessarily the best place to start, but it certainly is one thing that works. Um, but it, it absolutely has to provide some sort of benefit. Otherwise they're going to, you know, we go back into those reasons like why they might, they're pulling away. Like if there's not really any use to spending more time together, then why bother? Uh, I, I think even better, you know, if we're just, you know, getting beyond kind of the material needs here, I do think that staying together has to meet needs better than being apart. Once it, like we were just talking about this, right? How, you know, I just want to be quite honest here. Sometimes, you know, separation or divorce, it can present some benefits, at least in when cast in a certain light. I mean, if you get time away from the kids and you have time to yourself and you get to do the activities that you want to do and you don't have someone asking you to do things all the time, I mean, it does present some benefits. And so the spending time in the relationship I think has to be better than that, than what they're already doing, because it takes a lot of effort to shift away from what someone's doing. I, you know, I, I imagine we could even apply this to, you know, even healthy relationships, <laughs> the, the, a healthy relationship either. I mean, being, being with Ben, I imagine you, one of the big reasons that you're with Ben is it's better being with him than being away. And it, right. Absolutely. Yeah. No, if it became that every time I was around him, he was negative and putting me down or he was just really lethargic and didn't make me feel good about myself, then that would be really hard to want to spend time with him. Right. Absolutely. So we both have to work. Not that we don't have our ups and downs because we do, um, but we both have to work so that it is mutually beneficial so that we are uplifting so that we crave each other's presence. We crave each other's time. We crave each other's love and affection, right? That's an immense benefit when it's working the right way, for sure. I do even see this at times with uh, with the clients that we work with, where their spouse is saying that they're, they're ready to leave and we work with them to the point where they actually are starting to connect and they like being around each other. Um, I mean, there's certainly other obstacles, but this is, you know, if you if you do the right things, you can absolutely do a bit of a 180 where, you know, you were very tense and things felt very uncomfortable in a relationship. And you can make that turn around, I think, with just even a little bit of effort on your part, you know, just on one person's part. Yeah, it's about pattern interrupting the old patterns, mm -hmm. right? If you're both in some really negative cycles, pattern interrupting, removing those barriers. That's all part of really the A, which is make, you know, making those adjustments to really tell a new story. And then there's a question here in uh, the group. Where'd it go? Okay, what is a good way to ask for more time and effort when they are completely closed off and not willing? And what I really wanna clarify here, and Mark would say too, is that we have to do it at the right time. Like timing is really, really crucial here. Um, we can say this now, and if your relationship isn't at this point, it's not going to work. It's going to backfire. In fact, a lot of you probably up until this point have been asking your spouse for time. You've been asking um, to stop the divorce. You've been asking for them to come back home, to come back in the bedroom with you, to work on some things, maybe to go to counseling. And what has it done? It's only pushed them further away. <laughs> And so just like me with my cancer treatment, I mean, we couldn't have jumped to the end and done radiation while I was pregnant. Like that would have been disastrous. You know what I mean? So you have to be really careful that we solve problems in order. There's an order to this entire system. There's an order to the entire path. There's an order to the treatment. And so you can't just rush ahead to the end. That's why it's crucial that you have Ex, you know, guidance from an expert that can say, you know what, your relationship is now at this point. They are telling a new story about you. They're starting to see that you are understanding 
they're starting to see that you are appreciative of them. They're starting to see that you are trustworthy, that you're not gonna go and have another affair. We've made that progress. We've arrived at that milestone. It's Miles amazing there how much just like the one little line of a comment tells us about their situation. Like, you know, how do we get ask for more time when he's completely unwilling and closed off? I, and I, I mean, you heard it yourself. I, I, and I hope everyone else can hear it now that we've kind of gone over that. But yeah, like that situation, just like Heather was saying, means there hasn't been enough preparation to get to that point to ask that question yet. Right. And that's okay to acknowledge that. Um, it's We never want to rush the steps. Like I said, it would be disastrous. It would completely backfire and you would lose any positive momentum has been made. So it's knowing that it is possible. Knowing it is possible. You can get there. You're just not there yet. There's some more work that has to be done. Things need to be made safe. They need to be made more comfortable. They need to be made of kind of that 180 degree turn and maybe for some of you it's not quite that far but there is some level of change that needs to be made so that then we can say you're there now is the time and we can coach you what we're doing now show you how do we have that conversation and how do we know it's not going to backfire how do we know that the relationship is at such a state that it's strong enough now to proceed on to this next phase so like mark said there has to be some benefit to staying mm -hmm. and we have to make it desirable to stay right we have to show that it's going to um be much better together than apart I, I think beyond just even that um if you think about this stepping back into the the relationship there's a lot of uncertainty in there i mean we're we we're talking about this a little bit earlier the, the a very common complaint or uh concern is okay aren't things going to go back to the way they were if i come back or if i if I give a little bit more time, and this is where we get our second piece here is just, you you have to have, to bring some stability in here, you have to have a way to prevent some of the costs or concerns. Uh, what I'm telling you, like if, if we're boiling everything down, like I said, this is about a lack of certainty, a lack of security. And so we need to inject some of that certainty or security into the situation if they're going to even consider this. So if they're saying, well, um, if I come back, we're going to argue. And, you know, if I come back, it's just going to be this dull situation where I don't feel important. Okay. There has to be actually a way, some, you know, a way to address those concerns directly. Otherwise there's, there's just not enough certainty in this risky situation for your partner to even consider that that option um we, we could even go further into this topic i mean you know what some other things that you know directly related to this you know being together beyond having some benefits it it's going to be, be that much more enticing if coming together actually prevents costs so we have like a plan to prevent certain like emotional costs but like it actually coming together actively present prevents other costs like bills and the risk of financial stability and uh, other things like that. But um, th this is kind of, you know, I always like looking at, okay, what's a unhealthy relationship kind of situation, but how do we even apply this to healthy relationships? And I imagine Heather, I imagine once again, being with Ben um, does prevent some amount of costs in your life or makes things feel much more stable. I guess if we're talking about this in terms of stability. Right? Yeah, no, I, yeah, that's for sure. I think that'd probably be the definition of a good, uh, healthy marriage would have that foundational piece as one of its legs, right? That stability and that feeling cared for on both sides. With my my friends, I wanna go back to, to share their their story here for a little bit. Um, Cause I think it's really powerful. We can learn from each other's journeys more than us just throwing out random. I think we oh, weird. You. Yeah. We lost you there for a second. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that. Uh, I was just going to say with, with my, with my friends. So, um, you know, worked for several months on staying consistent, meeting those needs, 
increasing understanding, removing any barriers or negative patterns that were happening before. And a lot of them weren't ones that he could even see because just like for all of us, it's hard to see it when we're in it, right? It's like having that outside perspective is so necessary to get clarity on what's really going on. And so when the time was right, then he could have that conversation with her. And it was actually at mediation. <laughs> and so they got that far and that close into it. And he just had to be no pressure and know that it was going to be okay either way, even though he loves his wife dearly and, and wanted to save their relationship and keep their family intact. They have five children. And then she said, you know what? I do want to give this some time. I let's slow down this process. I'm going to give you some time to work on the relationship. And then now they're in that process where they have that time. And just last night I was told some really awesome news. He had done a race and he got hurt and he came home and asked for her help because she loves essential oils. And so he, he kind of was really dismissive of that before, as well as some of the other things that she really loves and treasures. <laughs> And he kind of thought that it was just kind of hokey or whatever. Um, but he allowed her to help him. And then she was, you know, bandaging him. And then it turned into a nice little massage and a really nice connecting moment. And so they're well on their way to fully restoring their marriage. And that's so far from where they were like four or five, six months ago, where she said, I'm done. I'm never coming back. I can never be happy here. He will never meet my needs. He doesn't care enough about me. And I'm 100% made up my mind. I'm out, you know? So that's kind of like the, the picture of what this really looks like. She now can see the benefit because he is meeting her needs and he is showing her through his words and his actions that these changes are real. And she is now believing them. But at first, I mean, it was like, what was it? Back in May, I think she was talking to me and she's like, I just don't know if it's real. I think he's just doing it as a ploy to get me back, you know? And so that would have been an indication. That's the wrong time to have this kind of conversation. That's the wrong time to ask for more time. But then he kept with it. He was consistent. And they got to the point now where they are working on things together. Instead of working on the divorce, they're working on their marriage. I, is this the, you know, I, I know you had changed the names. This is the, the gentleman that I had spoken with, right? Yeah. Okay. That's what that's what I was thinking there. Yeah. No, he's been working with Mark for several months. Now. That's yeah. okay. That's. <laughs> I, yeah. I just I was double checking because I was like, this sounds so familiar. <laughs> yeah. Um. All right. So. I want to actually demonstrate a different kind of story. Actually, one that that failed. Now, this wasn't a marriage relationship, but I, I feel like it has some similarities. I remember. Many years ago, we uh, lived in this uh, townhome right next to a another family. And I don't know what what was going on there. Um, I strongly su suspect that there was probably some sort of mental illness uh, going on with our, our neighbors. But our kids would go out and play in the backyard and they'd constantly get yelled at by this, uh, this neighbor uh, woman. Uh, she had a, at another time gotten really upset and thrown a brick in my, at, you know, towards my wife and yelled obscenities at, you know, and Heather, I don't, you know me and my wife were pretty mild mannered. So yeah. uh, we, were, we weren't really sure how to, oh, you're right. to handle that. We, we didn't live <laughs> there for about a couple of years, but ultimately, and we tried to fix the situation. Ultimately we said, okay, we gotta, we gotta leave. You know, and here's the analogy, like, okay, you know, almost like a, a marriage relationship, we're saying, okay, I'm done, I'm out, I can't handle this anymore. And um, at the same time, you know, what we're talking about here, this prevention of cost, like a way to actually feel like there's some stability. I feel like if she had come forward, you know, not that she needed to, but if she had come forward and said, you know what, I've been acting terrible and I, I apologize for some of the things that I've been saying, um, you know, and I'm, I'm going to try, you know, I'm going to try to do better. I've been getting some help that would have probably gone a long way. And I probably wouldn't have felt the need to, to move, to protect my, my kids or what, cause I wasn't there to, to, you know, to handle those situations when I was at work at that time. So, I mean, the same sort of sense here, if, you know, your spouse is heading out the door and there has to be some way to address 
this sense of stability, preventing further costs. Um, absolutely. Now the last little bit here um, in terms of things that are, are really needed, I think it kind of goes along with what we were talking about before, but simply a plan for the extra time. So if you can, if you're going to be asking for say six months extra time, you got to be prepared to actually explain what you're going to be doing with that time and how it's going to help and what's going to happen there. Um, otherwise, why bother? If uh, this is where I think a lot of people get stuck, they're saying, "Well, it could be better. Let's why don't we just try? Why don't you give me another six months? Let's just try a couple things." And that just, I, I think, you know, when I'm as it, the words are coming out of my mouth, once again, I think it is a matter of certainty. Once again, with, with this thing, and so maybe uh, each each time each each of these bullet points were hidden on the, this topic of certainty. Maybe that's really. I don't know, what do you think? Is that just really all that's needed here? Right, well, if you think about certainty, there's a sub certain level of of hope that's conveyed in that with, so hope is, the, is not wishful thinking, right? It's not just wishing. It's mm -hmm. hope is what you want coupled with action, knowing that it's gonna lead to something positive, right? Yeah. And so that's a big part of it, is that it's going there's gonna be action involved it's not just six months of time and time alone is gonna fix this, right? Sometimes we hear that like time will just heal this or time will just heal that, or we just need time apart. And time itself doesn't fix a darn thing. In fact, it tends to make things worse. It's the action and it's the intention that we bring to things that that's what brings about change. So right here, we wanna make sure we're bringing in that intention and coupling it with the right actions. Oh, Heather, I don't know how many times I've heard this, you know, working with clients and they'll tell me that their spouse says, well, I, I just need time to heal or I just need some time to myself to, to be good. And, and I, and we keep seeing with those same sort of excuses, you know, if nothing happens, then well, the, the, like you said, the time itself doesn't do anything. Um, and people, I think, get under this false pre um, expectation, false pretense that time heals, but it's really, there's so many other factors in play that make it so that people heal over time, but time by itself, if you're doing nothing, or if you're continuing a lot of the complaints, or if there's some ongoing damage, that time, like you said, could even make things worse just by itself. Right. We should do a marriage myth buster on that one. <laughs> oh yeah, we should. Uh, that time heals, wounds Always. Yeah. right no i if that were true then i would have hang on to my pain for what 15 12 years something like that i mean if time healed that and it just did it magically somehow on its own then i would have been stuck in that kind of pain for that long I mean, it's it, not what it took it took decisive it actions i think it helps you know as you separate yourself a little bit from that that pain but there's that's not i don't think that's the deciding factor i don't think that's the actual and this is what I like doing is like picking things apart. Okay, what piece of this actually creates the difference? And it's not it's not the time. Right. It's about looking at things differently, I think. I think we're getting a little bit, a little bit off on a tangent here with that. But, That's all right. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, with what time we have left, I do want to just touch on a couple other things just kind of beyond the scope. So we did talk about, just to recap, we talked about why your spouse wouldn't want to give you more time, you know, a few of the things that would be needed for more time. Um, but just a, a couple side notes here. Uh, we, we've been touching on this a lot and uh, we keep talking about this need for hope. I mean, Heather, you, even in the beginning, you were talking about this is kind of the podcast about hope in some small ways. Um, and we, we did touch on this a little bit, um, but what do you think actually creates hope in the relationship? Is it just, you, you're talking about before is about actions, but is, is, that, is that really the, the, the only part of it? Is that the only, the only thing that's really needed to create hope um, for this, you know, in this case for extra time? Right, so it's the opposite of wishful thinking. Sometimes people think hope is just wishing and wishing is weak and it doesn't really mean anything. I could wish on a star all, all, all day and my life would change, never change, right? It would stay exactly the same. And so for hope, 
I believe that hope is a positive intention coupled with action. And mm -hmm. so we have action that then allows us to move toward that. And right, so we can't just have intention without action. Some people say affirmations and they just kind of like hit the surface and don't actually make any change. We have to couple our intentions with action. And as we do that, we make tiny course corrections. It's never a smooth road, but we get up and we, you know, we, we try and we fail and then we keep going and we try and we fail and we keep going and that we learn from those little failures. And as we continue to learn from those failures, our ability to have belief in ourselves and in the outcome that we want becomes strengthened more and more and more. And we see the way to get where we want to go. Cause at first we might be like, I have no idea how I just know that I'm going to get there. I know that it's important to me enough that I have to work on this. And so as I work on it, I'm going to make some mistakes. I'm going to fail. And then I'm going to learn from that. And then I'm going to learn, okay, that's not the way to do it. This is the right way to do it. Right. And that then increases our confidence in ourselves. And I'm going to use that word again, certainty, right? That certainty or that security that the outcome is possible and we'll see ourselves moving closer and closer to it. I mean, for me, I have hope in my own relationship. I, you know, I have a belief or hope that it's going to continue. It's going to be, Jen and I are going to continue to be happy. We're going to do well. Um, and I'm trying to just really examine, is it simply about having that intention and the action? I, I think a little bit of this is, you know, I, I've seen a lot of evidence that we can get through big things, that we take action, that we examine our relationship, we keep doing the course correction. So I almost think that there's a little bit of that involved in here as well, that, that trust factor that almost like we were talking a lot about hope in terms of like this kind of future expectation, but I think some of what allows you to have that future expectation is all the success that you've had in the past as well. At least it builds up on itself. Yeah. Right. It, and I guess this is exactly what we were talking about earlier is you do have to build up to this point in order to, I guess, have this hope. Right. Know. So if like you have no communication and I see some comments still, we have no communication. So like I said, go back and listen to the podcast about communication. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, if you're like, I have no communication and you get from that point to now, wow, I've actually opened communication. My husband and I, we can sit and talk openly. We've had some amazing conversations. My wife and I, she shared something she hasn't shared with me for 25 years. And now I get to know her better. That's incredible. And you can see that you had a victory there. And then you can see, wow, I was able to stop my nagging. I was able to stop engaging when they tried to pick at me for a fight. That's a win. I'm making progress, right? And so you can look back at all of these moments where you had victory and you overcame and you can see those wins build upon each other, the little tiny win by win by win by win. Now, the opposite of hope is hopelessness. Hopelessness means there's nothing I can do. And that is a moment where you've surrendered all of your power. And that disempowerment leaves us feeling awful. It is one of the worst emotions that we could put ourselves in because we take away all of our power and we put our power on circumstances that we cannot control, right? And so what we need to do, and I wanna also state further that there's two really important energy, you can call it energy or whatever, but hopelessness, is I, I relate that to, to, to death, okay? It's disempowerment and it leads to lifelessness. It leads to inaction and it leads to the withering away of people, circumstances, whatever you're talking about, right? If I don't have hope in something, I'm not gonna work for it anymore. If I'm not working for it anymore, I'm not giving it life. I'm not giving it nutrients. I'm not feeding it. And so it will wither away. Contrast that with hope is something that we are going to plant a seed and even if I can't see it sprouting, just like earlier this spring with my daughter's garden, <laughs> like for weeks we were watering mud, having no idea if something was going to be harvested. However, we kept at it. We kept at it. We kept at it. And then we saw that tiny seed sprout. Relate that to I had a very opening conversation with my spouse, right? I see that win. And we give it life like hope. We feed what we believe in. We give it life. We give it nurturing. And then, then it allows it to grow. So 
those are the two different energies and we need to be care careful of which one we're choosing to feed at any moment. If we give into our fear and into the hopelessness, that's only going to lead to, to decay and not to life and thriving. But if we give it to what we want, then we give it that air and energy and light and nourishment and it will grow and it will strengthen. It doesn't become an oak tree overnight. It starts off as a tiny seedling, but that in and of itself is, is life growing. So I hope that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. So I, in this, for the sake of time, I, um, I think we need to wrap up here, but not before we get into our, our marriage myth buster. So the myth this week that we want to, to touch on the myth is if my spouse wants out, there's nothing I can do. A lot of these, a lot of these myths are coming from, like I said, actual, actual comments that we hear within the group. Regularly. Um, yeah. Yeah. On a regular this basis. Is that we hear regularly. Yeah. So I, I want to talk about where this comes from. Um, you know, the, this whole situation. Now, likely your spouse has sat on a decision. If they're pulling away, if they're considering leaving, they probably sat on this decision for a long time. Uh, most people don't want to come to the conclusion that they, they need to leave or that they want to divorce. That's not an easy decision to come by. So they, most people will sit on that for a long time, think about it. And they had to convince themselves with a lot of excuses about why things can't work in order to make that decision to actually tell you something about it. They have to convince themselves for a long time. And so they, they've been working on this for a while. The thing is, because of this, because of all the setup, it takes a lot of work to reverse this. And what I find is, you know, a lot of people touch on these surface issues. A lot of the things that we talk about in these podcasts, and they, they're not really focusing on the right things. And so not everyone makes all the changes necessary to make a difference. So why is this myth false? If I've just told you that, hey, this is a difficult decision to turn around, people aren't really making the right changes. So someone who says they want out, the reason being is they might, you know, like we talked about a little bit earlier, why they're not wanting to get more time. They may not want to expend effort on a fruitless situation. Um, they might not believe anything can change. So they may be worried about being hurt again. But the thing with all this is, that means if we explain this just a little bit differently, it means that there are specific things that lead to the idea of wanting out. Um, so if they're saying, okay, this is a worthless or a fruitless uh, effort and nothing can change and I'm gonna be hurt again, if, we, if you can actually address those concerns directly in such a way that they actually, you know, feel like you're actually listening and you can actually take care of those problems, this is a, a situation that we can start chipping away at and we can start turning, turning everything around. Now, it might not be all at once. It might not be a 180 jump, which I think a lot of people are expecting. And I think this is actually where these sort of comments come from. They say, I tried this and I tried this and nothing happened without realizing that it, it's going to take some time and some effort because it took a lot of time to get to this place to begin with. Uh, the thing is many couples all over the world, they reconcile even after one partner declares that they're done. And what they do when they say nothing's gonna work here, the idea itself becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. You say that nothing can be done you, because you tried some things, well, then absolutely nothing's going to happen. But what Heather and I talk about on these podcasts and our programs and our coaching uh, sessions, the, the path method, you know, all those things, it lead, it does increase chances, especially if you follow them correctly. So we, I mean, we just even earlier, we, we were talking about a win where someone was able to turn things around. We talk about wins every single podcast. So absolutely, mo pretty much every one of these wins that we share, Heather, wouldn't you agree? Most of these wins that people share, it's coming from people whose spouse said, there's nothing that can be done. And I just went out. Right, exactly. 
Right. No, we're not talking to the healthy. I'm sorry, but the the sick need no, you know, the healthy need no physician. Right. It's the yeah. same. And so uh, for sure, one of the things that lights us up and just is why we do this is because we get to see the the successes. We get to see the transformations. I just got an email the other day and I need to share this with you, Mark. I haven't even done it yet um, from a client several years ago. And she sent a picture of her family on the beach celebrating. And this was a woman who was dead set on divorce and refused to give up the divorce because she found leverage in getting kind of what she wanted out of her husband from it and had a hard time letting that go out of that fear that now her needs wouldn't be met. So they were kind of in this limbo situation where she was using the divorce <laughs> to get her needs met and was afraid of letting it go. And so they were just stuck because he was meeting her needs. And, and anyway, now we've been able to help them to save their marriage fully, get him back home. He was sleeping in a camper trailer on their land for a couple months or several months. And they'd been in therapy for over 20 years before they came to us without really making any progress until the point where she was finally like, I'm done, right? And now we get to see them on the beach with their daughters celebrating on uh, just having a great time and having their family completely intact. And like, like my doctor said, this is just another Tuesday. Mark and I have such a hard time choosing our wins because we get so many of them. They're literally pouring in every all single the time. Day. Yeah, it's, there's a ton of these. So yeah, I think that myth there, if the spouse wants out, there's nothing that can be done. That's it just doesn't add up. Right. And I encourage you, if you're feeling like I just need to see the evidence, like show me the proof. I want to talk to some people who want to hear their stories. Go check them out on our YouTube channel, um, High Thrive Coaching. They're on there. You can listen to them. You can hear it in their own words. Right. And here in our the Thriving Marriage Facebook group. And you can see the evidence. I believe that results don't lie. And so above all, really tap into where you want to be in your marriage. What matters most to you? And when you're on your last day, how do you want to look back on your life and remember it? Who do you want to become? And knowing that the small choices that we make now are the only choices that we ever make. All we have is now. It really is. We only have this moment and this moment and this moment. And so if we make those small incremental changes, that's what can lead up to this big picture where we get our spouse to agree to slow down or stop the divorce, give us some time. And then you can start to work together on things. And several years from the road, you know, down the road, you'll be the one sending me pictures of you guys on the beach. <laughs> and I'll be saying, oh, that's awesome. Good job. You did it. And you'll look back and be like, man, I can't believe when it was just so hard to even have a conversation. It was so hard to even like have any kind of sense of trust or security. And now look how far we've come. And that will be worth everything to you. So if you want more help with this, again, if you're wondering, is my relationship ready to have this conversation? Can I ask my spouse right now to buy six months of time? Um, what do we need to do to open up communication? How do we set some healthy boundaries? How do we like meet their needs? Like how do I show understanding? Any of those things then go to highthrivecoaching.com slash apply and you can have a completely 100% free breakthrough call with us where we can talk about uh, your exact situation, your marriage thumbprint, because every one of us is so different, right? And we will be able to show you what would be the best fit for our coaching or any of our other programs that we use um, teaching you our path method. So thank you so much, Mark. Thank you everyone for joining us today. I hope that this has instilled some hope in you and showed you what is possible. Know that you can get there. It is possible. So hold on to that hope. And next week we're going to share with you, this was your request, healthy boundaries. <laughs> we're going to do an entire podcast on healthy boundaries and how to set them so that they don't backfire, they don't push your spouse further away, but they help everyone to feel safe, secure, and to really build a healthy and thriving marriage. So thank you, Mark, and thank you everyone for watching and listening. We'll see you next time. Bye. Thanks for listening to The Thriving Marriage, your A to Z blueprint for not just surviving marriage, but thriving. Until next time, my friends, thrive on.